the Disney Plus show you are involved in is The Mandalorian, which just kind of exploded when it released last fall. Um, and it looks fantastic. And then I saw the behind the scenes footage and like I watch a lot of behind the scenes documentaries and I like to think I know how things are made, but it blew my mind. Yes. Uh, the volume that you guys used and the way that the the backgrounds are being, um, you know, rendered in real time. Um, but I did want to ask, I mean, you, you know, this project was so secretive when John came to you, um, how did he describe it? What was, what was kind of, what were the early days on the Mandalorian? Like the Mandalorian is the perfect film at the perfect time because you have, you have a company like Lucasfilm and ILM who are innovators and, and, and constantly pushing the boundaries. You have someone like John who is doing the same. Like they, I don't believe they'd worked together specifically before this project. Yeah. Um, so when you have people that are automatically um, hardwired to push boundaries and, uh, and, and, and mix up the status quo, and you have the technology with LED panels that are becoming shootable, you have 3D gaming engines, you have all these elements that are there floating. There, and bear in mind, nothing like this had been put together specifically. Like there were things like on Rogue One, which effectively was the genesis of, uh, of the concept with, um, with ILM, you know, on, on Rogue One, we built, if you look at the behind the scenes on Rogue One, we built a, a kind of a volume. You know, there's around the spaceships, we built a, a, a horseshoe and a, and a lid and a, an uplight. Like we, we effectively built the same concept in terms of lighting, but we didn't have a real-time 3D gaming engine yeah. interaction. We didn't have that because that was, remember, that was 2015. Even though it's not long ago, like it's long enough ago that, that the LED panels were nine mil then, and now they're two point four on Mandalorian. So that's that shows you how much the technology has progressed. Yeah. In in that two and a half years or three and a half years. So um, when I met with John about that, we we spoke about what this could be. You know, d doing a Star Wars TV show could be very expensive. You know, it could be prohibitively expensive because Star Wars is requires a lot of prop building and a lot of character building and and so we wanted to with ILM's help be able to make it a financially viable option to to solve all the problems that you have with shooting a blue screen blue screen environment and if you go into a studio without a set effectively you've got a blue screen as a DP you have to light it of what you think it should look like yeah you don't have any reference of what the background looks like. You might have some concepts, but effectively you're lighting up what you think it should look like. You're framing it to what you think it should look like. There's nothing real. As you don't have anything to, to cling on to. And as filmmakers, we're all used to clinging onto something. Like the difference between a, a, a shot that's here and a shot that's there is significant. Mm -hmm. Like the difference between a feeling of an actor here versus here is significant. And when you don't have any of that, uh, when you got blue screen and you don't have anything to, to grab onto visually, it's very hard to do a, a good job. And so, the like I said, all those elements, those those balls that were in the air, were all starting to land at around the same time. Um, we did a little test in I think June before we started shooting in uh, October. Um, just to make sure that the concept would work, and and it did. You know, there were there were definitely people that were going, mm, there are better ways to do this, or there are different ways to do this. But eventually, this concept kind of won through, and um, you know, it was a very rewarding experience. It was very, um, there was a lot riding on on ILM's shoulders at that point, a lot riding on my shoulders, a lot riding on John's shoulders. Because if this technology didn't work, there's a lot of money invested in the hardware. If this technology didn't work. If we turn up on day one, everybody's done their job, costumes done their job, everyone knows their lines. We turn up on day one and it does not work. There is no plan B. You know, there was if the if the power didn't if a rat had chewed out the cable to the power, like we, we did 
well, all these problems that could occur, we were trying to get ahead of and trying to preempt. Thankfully, that touch wood, thankfully the worst did not happen and we always had something to shoot. It might not be, might not have been 100% perfect, but we could always wrangle it. It's incredible. And I think it's in keeping with the spirit of Star Wars. I mean, George Lucas was breaking those boundaries back when he was making A New Hope. Um, I think motion control uh, was something that he kind of helped pioneer and stuff. Um, totally. And it was funny because um, we we managed to I, to show quite a few people through the volume. All right, but before I had, I had to leave and go and prep June, before I left to prep June, um, I showed quite a few filmmakers through the volume and show them how it would, how it could work and what it was good for, you know. And I won't I won't name drop at this point, but I could, and I would sound pretty cool <laughs> if I could. But the George, we've seen some photos. I think the Russo brothers and uh, uh, I saw George Lucas. Yeah, so I will drop George's name. So George did come. <laughs> and I showed George through, and it was so funny because all these other filmmakers were like, "Oh my God, this is amazing! Oh, this is mind blowing!" And George is like, "Yeah, this is good." Yeah, this is what I wanted to do 25 <laughs> years ago. Like, he's, he's so matter-of-fact about, yeah, yeah, of course it is, like, parallax. Of course, yeah, absolutely. Like, it's it's totally, I mean, I could see that he could see it 30 years ago. Yeah. But 30 years ago, it wasn't even a, you know, spark in someone's eye. It was it was barely thinkable. So I think he was kind of like, well, 30 years too late, but but fantastic. <laughs> like, <laughs> congratulations on, uh, on achieving you know, what what should be the perfect setup. I mean, bear in mind too, this is version 1.0. Like yeah. there is, this, this has, this has a lot, LED technology, real time gaming engine. This has a lot of potential in the future. And I think that um, people see the the making of Mandalorian and I, and I'm, um, and I love when people see it and they, they have their minds blown because that was the intention. Mm-hmm. But 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 I'm already in like version four in my brain, like mm-hmm. where, you know, you've got movable flats and you've got um, s- stages that are maneuverable and like create a whole range of set pieces with the technology. Um, I think's totally viable, and I, I would say watch this space because it's it's only going to get more interesting. Well, I know season two is wrapped. Was a was the technology able to be improved for that, or, or are they using pretty much the same thing? So season two, I wasn't involved with Baz Idowan, who um, took over. We didn't take over. That's a that's a misnomer. Baz and I worked quite closely. Um, it's a very intensive uh, thing as a DP because t- it involves lighting, pre lighting loads, and and investigating LED panels. It was very very. Uh, very busy time in pre-production um, for something that hasn't been done before. Like, so that was a big part of the thing. So Baz and I worked sort of hand in hand a lot to, 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 to get that season done. So um, when I left, he then took over the reins um, and, and shot the remainder and then he shot season two. But yes, they did, I believe, make some improvements. There was a couple of shape improvements that we made that we learned. Um, and I think they, I think on season one, we had different uh, panels on the roof versus the wall based on availability. Um, that was solved. The way it was mounted, there were some technical things that they solved as well. So, yeah, I, I, I believe they did make some improvements. But again, I mean, you know, I, I see a world where every film, almost every film, will use this technology in some way, shape, or form, be it from a a two hundred million dollar blockbuster down to a two million dollar independent movie, using it for one sequence that they they dry hire a studio that's already been built and they they get in there like a location. Um, so I, I believe that when the technology kicks on and, and and gets widely adopted, when people understand what it can do, um, I believe it'll be used quite a lot. It's incredible. Um... I would be remiss if I didn't ask uh, what it's like to light the child or baby Yoda. And was there any idea at the time that, that this character was just going to absolutely explode? Um, yeah. I mean, it's a cute, it's a cute. <laughs> it just became this entirely like there's the Mandalorian and then there's baby Yoda. I know it, <laughs> it, it, it didn't fully surprise me. I tell you what, it, it kind of, 
didn't surprise me. I knew that it was going to be a thing. My my kids came to visit the set, and um, I specifically made sure that they did not see the the child. Oh, interesting. Because I knew, first of all, the first thing they'd talk about when they went back to school would be <laughs> Baby Yoda. And this is obviously six months before it comes out, and that, that would be a disaster. Um, and also that they'd love it. And my, my daughter right now, she's really a bit annoyed with me about that because she wanted to give Baby Yoda <laughs> a hug. And anyway, one day in the future. But um, <laughs> it, it, to, to like Baby, I mean, listen, it's to like any, any prosthetic, ultimately. Yeah. You know, and and um, and John, John very cleverly kind of suggested and kept suggesting and recommending, you know, a bit of bit of backlight on the fuzz and on his on the on the child's hair and like, it, just little things to help kind of make it less rubbery and and more more real. Yeah. Um, one thing I am super curious about, about the volume, um, what is the po- post-production like? Cause you said, you know, this was six months before it came out, you were shooting. And I know for George, one of the impediments, uh, for him and bringing a live action Star Wars series to life was that it was just cost prohibitive and it would take forever for the post-production. Um, how much is done there, like in camera on set and what's the post-production like in terms of finishing out those effects? Um, in theory. Most of it's done in camera. You know, there are. You probably need to speak specifically to the the post supervisor because I don't know numbers. Um, sure. But I but I know for a fact. Again, when I was putting together um, a, a demo a, a demo reel for the visitors that came on set, um, that none of that was post produced and it was all in camera. And the stuff that I was able to to, to bring out to show people, people were like that's straight off camera like it's literally it's graded and that's it there's been no um no post work done to it um you you know there are times where if you're doing a wide shot you're actually seeing the seam of the volume the seam of the edges and the seam at the top and there were some very simple fixes that that ilm had to do for a lot of it um but again you probably need to talk to them but but you can effectively edit a movie in a TV show that's all in camera, there's no very little blue, so you can you can effectively watch the film, watch the the show before post production's touched it, and you've got a really good idea of how it looks. That's crazy. That's yeah, literally all they're, all they're doing is tidying up. You know, that's the, that's the ultimate goal is that all they have to do is tidy up the edges. That's awesome. 